Thank you very much for the very kind invitation to uh, Dr. Mann and Dr. Uh, Etamad Razai and to all of you for having me. It really has been a great day. I, the residents have done really well and you have a really good group of residents so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, tried to choose a topic that would appeal to a large number of, of us. And uh, it's an area that we don't talk about a lot, uh, or we don't think about a lot, but there's more and more um, uh, evidence that says we really should focus on what are the blind spots of chest CT because we're doing more and more lung cancer screening. And I've had the opportunity of being involved with a lung cancer screening uh, trial from the Terry Fox uh, study for the past five years and so as the sole reader in Ottawa I've been able to see a lot of these cases uh, come through and if I miss them or someone it's really I have to look at myself and uh, I have no disclosures I want to acknowledge also the radiologists from my group who really very generously contributed to um, this talk I asked them if they could tell me what were some of the, the cases that they might have missed? And uh, radiologists from all the sections provided, uh, except for the neuroradiologist, uh, who don't read any chest CTs, <laughs> uh, provided uh, a lot of cases. And I, I really think it was very generous of them to do that. Of course, their names are not on the cases. So this is one of the first cases that really sparked my interest. And this was a Terry Fox screening study. Um, this patient had a very strong uh, smoking history. Um, they also had had asbestos exposure. And um, they had quit smoking. And they were eligible for the Terry Fox screening trial. And this was the first CT. This is one of the images. And this is the second CT two years later. And this is the third CT. So you can see that we failed this patient because we, I didn't uh, identify the area that was abnormal, which is in, the, um, is in the central region, which is one of those blind areas. And um, as, as I can say, we, we can either focus on our mistakes, or, but you have to not be busy denying them. So the objectives of this uh, are to recognize what are the common blind spots on chest CT. And then what are some practical methods of inspecting the chest, uh, including those areas that where we need to increase conspicuity uh, to try and help us detect the abnormalities. And so that's what my goal is for, for this talk. So we're going to talk about um, just a brief introduction, talk about the airways, the, the lung, the pleura, the extra pulmonary structures, and then how we improve detection. So as I mentioned, chest CT is one of the very um, common uh, studies that we do radiologically. As you know, it has almost replaced the chest x-ray when the patient comes into the eMERGE. And uh, we, we know that we're going to be doing more uh, CT of the lung with screening, which is coming to Ontario probably in the next few years. It's already being done a lot of places in uh, the US. And really, if we are aware of the blind spots, this should help us improve our radiologist's accuracy and efficiency. So that's uh, why we should probably be aware of it. So the first area to remember to look at is the scout. So we're responsible for reporting the findings on a scout, and it's, uh, it should be included on every chest CT. Sometimes the only findings that we see that are significant are present on the scout. There might be bony lesions, uh, there might be dilated bowel loops, and so that's one of the areas we have to look at. So for example here, this uh, humeral fracture was really very subtle on the uh, axial images. But if you look at the scout, you can see that one arm is down and the other arm is up. So that might be a clue that we're dealing with a problem. And then looking at the coronal images might draw your attention a little bit uh, focused on that area of fracture. So the scout is really something important to remember to look at. What about the airways? So I'll just scroll through and I'm going to give you several uh, cine loops just showing you what we, we can see 
recognizing that I'm going through them quite quickly with, with um, not which would be something you would see, you know, have more time to look at. And you can appreciate the airspace uh, changes in the lower lobes. And some of you might have appreciated the uh, airway abnormality, but that is one of the most common blind spots on the chest. So out of uh, a study that was done uh, several years ago, looking at lung cancers that were missed, most of them were endobronchial. And if you looked at the mean diameter, it was actually 1.2 centimeters, so not insignificant. Uh, it just, we have to look in that area to identify it. It could be endoluminal nodules, or it can be subtle wall thickening, or even an irregular contour of the lumen. And in this case, this was the uh, lesion. Uh, this was picked up, but when I show it prospectively, a lot of radiologists don't pick it up. Obviously, if you know that it's there, you can do the reconstructions, and that can help you uh, identify it. If you don't know it's there, you may only appreciate it on the coronal um, reformatted images if you're looking in that area. So it's a very good uh, tool to remember. Looking at the coronal images can be very helpful to use uh, for airway lesions. And obviously there are a lot of lesions that we see in the airways. There are metastases, quite common, uh, primary bronchial tumors, as well as tracheal tumors, which is, are more rare, and then some of the benign findings. And here is another case where it's difficult to appreciate on the one axial image. I think it's a little bit easier on the coronal, but using the two, uh, the axial and the coronal, is helpful to identify the airway lesions. The lungs are another uh, area where we miss lesions. And based on studies, CT can miss up to 47% of lung nodules, which is a very high number. Um, there are some areas where we tend to miss more lesions than others. So uh, the more commonly missed areas are in the central region, so within two centimeters of the hilar mediastinum. Uh, the lower lobes, as opposed to a chest x-ray where we tend to miss more upper lobe lesions, on CT we tend to miss more lower lobe lesions. Ground glass nodules are areas that we can miss as well. And, uh, areas of parenchymal involvement within the collapsed lung. So if you have an atelectatic lung, sometimes we miss that there may be lesions within that atelectatic lung. So in terms of the percentage, uh, we don't have data for all of these areas, but central is recognized as one of the most common areas. Um, in one study, the lower lobes was responsible for missing up to two, uh, three quarters of the lung nodules. And in lung cancer studies uh, with screening low dose, because there's a lot of noise from the low dose, we miss more of those ground glass attenuation nodules. So just to show you some examples here, and uh, again, I recognize this is fairly quick going through. This uh, was a nodule, and if you focus on the central area, this, I don't know if you saw it, but I'll go to the next year. It was missed uh, on two subsequent years. I don't know if you can appreciate it there. So if we take some still images, that's what it looks like on the axial and the uh, coronal reformatted images. And if we look back um, in 2010, it was there as well, but it's the size of the vessel. So it's really easy to miss it when it's right close to some of the, uh, the, the hilar vessels or the central vessels. And you can see it's slowly growing over time. So that's one area where the, the close to the size of the vessels is quite a blind area for us. And even that last study uh, was done with a, we had a double reading situation and the first reader missed it. And, this, and uh, we picked it up on the, with the second read. Now this is the uh, area that really brought my uh, interest to it. And this was the study I showed you first. So this is the area um, in the hilar region where we didn't appreciate the thickening posteriorly to the, the bronchus intermedius. And here on 2012, it becomes even more obvious, but it still is quite subtle. There's a lot of noise with the adjacent uh, mediastinum and we don't have the whole nodule surrounded by lung, so it's more difficult to appreciate. And uh, it's clearly growing over time. 
So this is the one where we hit a 9.5 centimeter mass at presentation. And out of all of the cases that I asked for, for colleagues to send me, probably this was the most common area where we had misses. So close to the mediastinum is just an area that we sometimes do not do as well on. So we have to remember to always look in that area, the posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius, it should be less than three millimeters. It should be, basically, there should be lung filled with air posterior to it. So it's a good area to remember to look at as, as one of those blind spots. If we don't have contrast, uh, looking for areas close to the mediastinum, sometimes it's difficult, as in this case where we don't see a definite abnormality, and just a few months later, this patient develops quite significant adenopathy. So it's not really a lung lesion, but it's right in the, in the mediastinum, and this is an area quite difficult for us when there's no contrast uh, on board. Um, here is another lesion that is just abutting the mediastinum, quite difficult to appreciate on the lung windows. On the mediastinal windows, we can see it abutting the uh, esophagus, and uh, this is a, a small metastasis. Now the lower lobes uh, are also areas that are more difficult to appreciate, sometimes because they're not fully surrounded by lung. Um, and in this case, uh, this was actually picked up. This is an area of mixed attenuation, some areas of lucency as well as some solid parts. And that was the area previously in 2011. We also know that areas close to bullae can be hard to appreciate as, as developing uh, nodules or densities. I think it's very much easier if you look at the coronal uh, or the sagittal uh, reformatted images to really appreciate that it's there. And in this case, we did a follow-up three months later and could identify that there was a persistent um, mass, and this turned out to be uh, a mucinous uh, adenocarcinoma. The other uh, area in the lung that can be subtle, especially when you have a uh, a low-dose CT is when you're looking for ground glass attenuation nodules. And here we, we see a lot of noise from the, 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 the shoulders in the upper lobes. There's some patchy areas of ground glass in, there, in the left upper lobe. There's another area in the right upper lobe. It's really difficult to be sure that we have some definite abnormality. The patient was brought back for a follow-up in six months. And we can see that that ground glass in the right upper lobe is increasing in size. The one in the, the upper lobe on the left is really not persistent. I think the coronal images are helpful, again, to look at another projection to see that uh, if you find the, uh, the area of concern, is it really persistent? So we have reformatted images on all of our chest CTs uh, to, to help us in that regard. And we do that in the coronal projection. The other area that can be a blind spot is looking at a collapsed area of lung. And it, we can see the, the atelectatic lung is very markedly enhancing, but there's a fairly large mass that is in this atelectatic lung. And if you don't think to look within the atelectatic lung, you might miss it. Uh, and this turns out to be a very large squamous cell carcinoma. Here's another patient uh, with, uh, who presents with a pleural effusion. And you can see that there is another mass in the medial aspect of the uh, atelectatic lung. Uh, that is uh, uh, another uh, lung carcin bronchogenic carcinoma. So it's just helpful to remember those areas in the lung where you want to look to make sure that you're not going to miss some of those abnormalities. And part of the problem we have is we also have this satisfaction of search uh, uh, kind of error. So we might see some abnormalities and we might forget to look for other abnormalities. Uh, and in two studies uh, that were lung cancer was missed, uh, a, a large number of patients had other uh, findings. So they had TB or they had big pleural effusions or they had emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis. And so those are things that we should be aware of when we see a lot of, the, it's a complicated chest, we have to look for the whole, look through the whole lung. So that's the lung, and probably most of us are really trained to look for lung nodules, and, and we shouldn't be missing a lot of these, and I don't think a lot of us do. But then we also have to remember the other parts uh, of the chest. So the pleura is an important area to, to look for. And 
Uh, small uh, pleural lesions can often be missed. The pleura is quite large, so we may miss small little nodules um, because we don't get to look at the entire chest. So it's really important to check the entire pleural surface for any kind of nodularity. And even with careful verification, as in this patient, where we see a pleural effusion and we don't see any kind of pleural thickening or enhancement, we may miss the pleural metastases that are very obvious at thoracoscopy. So we know that our resolution on chest CT is not ideal for, for pleural lesions. But we have to look carefully, and in this case, we actually do see pleural thickening that is along the costal pleura, there's enhancement, and there's some nodularity as well. And that could be helpful, and in this case it was missed, and so the surgeon was really surprised to find extensive pleural uh, metastasis. This was actually a mesothelioma. So it's really important, especially if you have a pleural effusion, to look for that pleural nodularity or thickening. Now, if you don't have a pleural effusion, it, it can be more challenging. And here is another patient who has uh, a, a primary lung cancer in the right upper lobe. And on the axial images, it's pretty subtle. It's pretty hard to identify any abnormalities of the pleura. Probably on the coronal images, it's a bit more obvious that there are multiple uh, areas of thickening nodularity along the minor fissure, the major fissure, and along the diaphragmatic surface. So there's evidence that if you use the, the if you're looking for pleural disease, using the coronal reformatted images are, is very helpful for identifying disease. And this has a profound impact on the patient's management. Instead of being a T1 lung cancer, now they uh, have pleural metastases and likely will require chemotherapy for their treatment. Okay. We looked at a, a, a 100 patients with mesothelioma and we actually found that uh, the vast majority with multi-detector CT and coronal reformats, we could identify the pleural thickening if they had mesothelioma. Uh, it's just a matter of really careful uh, evaluation. What about the extra pulmonary structure? So we're looking very carefully for the lung nodules and we're looking for the pleura. Now what about the, the lymph nodes, uh, the vascular structures, uh, and the chest wall? And lymph nodes, we should be very good at looking for, but there are some areas that are more blind on the, on the chest, typically in the supraclavicular areas. And uh, we also know that um, posterior uh, adenopathy there can be difficult. PET studies have shown that PET is far more accurate than CT. And here is an example of a patient with supraclavicular adenopathy that I just don't think you can really appreciate on the CT. And with the PET, it shows up very well that it's on the right side. So we know that there are blind areas uh, in this area. Um, some of the other blind spots, looking at the uh, nodal stations in the internal mammary nodal stations, uh, the cardiophrenic angles, pericardiac lymph nodes, parasophageal, retropleural, those are all areas that we should be looking at to make sure we don't have uh, adenopathy. And then we may also have hilar nodes that are hypervascular that can mimic the vessels in the hilar regions, particularly with renal cell carcinoma uh, and, and even thyroid cancer with mel or melanoma. So those areas may mimic vast vessels and be difficult to find. So here is an example of a retropleural lymph node that can, if you see this in conjunction with, say, other adenopathy, might suggest the diagnosis of lymphoma. Uh, this patient uh, had a, a, a study done uh, for lung cancer screening. It was done without contrast. And there is a big mass in the subcranial region. There's no contrast in board. It's sometimes it's a difficult uh, uh, case to, to identify. And we can see that uh, with the contrast, much, much easier to uh, identify. But we don't have contrast for many of the lung cancer screening studies. So, uh, it's something we just have to remember to look at. Uh, Dr. Islam will be happy with this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the heart is an area that we really have to remember to look at. Uh, and 
We know that with faster scanning, with cardiac gating, we are seeing the cardiac structures with greater and greater detail. And uh, in this study by Foley uh, in 2010, uh, looking at a number of uh, CTs of the chest, 78% had at least one incidental cardiac finding, and only 3% of them were reported. So it, it shows the, the, the degree to which we don't always report those cardiac findings, and it's uh, sometimes a little bit of a black box, you know, when we're looking at the chest. Uh, we know that cardiac metastases occur with some frequency in lung and breast cancer, uh, and we also can see it with melanoma and uh, lymphoma. We also know that there are cardiac abnormalities that are congenital that we may see that are significant. For example, anomalous course of the coronary arteries or small septal defects that are really important to recognize. And we also may identify intracardiac thrombi that uh, are really significant uh, for the patient. So as radiologists, we are responsible to report all of the cardiac findings that we see. Uh, we should be looking at the size of the cardiac chamber. We should be looking for coronary and vas valvular calcification. Uh, if there's coronary arteries, if, there, if there's any bypass, uh, and any pericardial effusion or thickening, any abnormalities uh, in the thickness or the uh, density of the myocardium is also important. And then any intracavitary defects that we see suggestive of, say, mural thrombi. And I'll just show you this case. This is uh, unfortunately a case where I think he had 20 chest CTs and not one of them reported the finding. So it, it's something that it, we all can do. It's very easy to, to fall prey to this. So this was a 71-year-old female, or a female who had a history of sarcoma. And uh, this is in 2012. There was no abnormalities except there was a liver metastasis. In 2013, we start to see a little bit of thickening of the myocardium. And we see a little heterogeneity to the the uh, filling of the left ventricle. And uh, the coronal uh, images show better the uh, thickening of the myocardium in at least two sites uh, there, which, uh, which should suggest that you may be dealing with met metastatic disease. Now, we don't have any confirmation, but he had metastatic disease that was disseminated, and this was a change, so it's presumed that he does have metastatic disease to the myocardium. Um, this is another uh, example of an area that can be missed. This was actually on an abdominal CT, and the patient came in with uh, decompensation without any known cause. And we can see this uh, heterogeneous, uh, it, it, this area of increased uh, attenuation in the left ventricle with a small little thrombus. And on echocardiography, uh, he was confirmed to have a mural thrombus from a left ventricular infarct with a, a little bit of focal aneurysmal dilatation. So these are some areas that we can uh, help to guide the, the treatment of the patient. Vascular abnormalities uh, are also quite uh, important for us to identify. And uh, in this study by uh, Greg Gladish, uh, there were 4% of incidental pulmonary emboli seen in patients who underwent chest CT, and only a quarter of them were reported. So even though we're not looking at the chest for uh, evidence of pulmonary emboli, we, we have to look at the, you know, if it's not timed maximally, we have to make sure that we don't miss those uh, occult pulmonary emboli. We also can see thrombi in the uh, jugular vein, the subclavian vein, or the inferior or superior vena cava, and we may see aortic dissections, even if it's not done as a study for aortic dissection uh, or even aneurysms. And actually, many of the cases that I was sent were, had to do with vascular uh, abnormalities. So here is a case uh, with, that was done for time to, uh, for pulmonary emboli. And you can see that there is a change in the actual intraluminal density of the sphere vena cava, and there's a small thrombus uh, in the SVC. Um, the coronal images are probably helpful if you think that there's an abnormality to, to look at. Here is another patient with a supervena cava thrombus. And here is a patient uh, who was again done for another reason, but we found incidentally that there is distension of the um, 
uh, the uh, left subclavian vein, and it was completely filled with thrombus. So this was picked up prospectively, but it can be a very difficult area for us to uh, identify. Okay. Um, this is a difficult case, but uh, it was done uh, in the uh, urgent care to rule out pulmonary emboli. And we have great opacification of the pulmonary uh, arteries. Uh, but if you notice that there is some abnormality with the ascending aorta, and it's, it's challenging because it's obviously not done timed for that, uh, uh, for that structure. And if you look and compare to the prior, you can see that the diameter of the aorta is larger. And there's some heterogeneous enhancement of the aorta which might suggest the diagnosis. And that's uh, three days later, uh, the definitive CT showing the aortic dissection. So it's very hard to make that call prospectively, but we should be looking at those areas that are not well opacified to make sure that we don't miss some of the, uh, these significant findings. And if you look back, it's, it's difficult to call prospectively, but we do see probably a little difference in that density there uh, and in the uh, coronal reformatted images. Uh, the chest wall is another area where we tend to miss uh, abnormalities. So the bones are very common. Uh, we have to uh, use often reformatted images to help us with the, the spine or the looking at the ribs. And it can be really helpful to make a diagnosis with, of an occult bone metastasis. Uh, also maybe spinal infection or trauma. So it's an area that we have to remember to look at. And here is a case uh, of a man who presented with a fever and shortness of breath. We can see the clear-cut left pleural effusion and uh, left, uh, probably left-sided pneumonia with an empyema. But we have to also appreciate that there is thickening surrounding the spine. And that may be the only clue that we have to look at the bones. And this is the bone windows. And this turns out to be a case of pot disease. Uh, with, with TB spondylitis. The subcutaneous tissue is another area that we don't always look at. Um, we kind of forget sometimes to, to, to include that in our search. And, and yet subcutaneous metastases may be a significant finding that portends a poor prognosis for a patient with a, a, a primary cancer somewhere else. So metastasis to the subcutaneous tissue has a poor uh, survival, a median survival in non-small cell lung cancer of just three months. So it is a, an important finding to report. And we may see it with melanoma mets, but we may see it with a number of other uh, tumors, such as uh, renal cell, a number of other causes. And we also may identify abscesses in the chest wall that w the, for which the patient is presenting. And here is another. Uh, this was a, a, a gentleman with malt lymphoma, and he literally had 20 CTs in the course of the, the, his time at the hospital. And this uh, showed a slowly growing lesion, just causing a little convexity of the pectoralis muscle. Yeah, so it's, it's hard, very, very hard. And uh, my point is not to say we're all going to be perfect after this, but there, there are subtle findings. But if we remember to look at them, it might help us uh, to pick these up. And this turns out to be lymphoma uh, involvement, so a recurrence there. Uh, this is a bit easier to identify. This is a, an implantation metastasis from uh, a, after a previous uh, lung biopsy for, with uh, a metastatic uh, uh, focus there. Now, the other area that, that I think is quite challenging is in the uh, infraclavicular area. And if I show you this, this patient has the contrast being injected on, through the left arm, which causes a lot of noise from the contrast injection. And it's quite difficult to appreciate that there is an area of thickening in that infraclavicular area. <coughs> on the uh, coronal images, it maybe shows up a little bit better, but again, very, very challenging. When we have a lot of noise from the contrast or from other structures, 
we know that our sensitivity is reduced. So this is an area that can be quite uh, frequently missed and this turns out to be a, a metastasis from a recurrent breast cancer. Okay. Now, moving on to breast, this is actually one of the blind areas uh, on chest CT that we really have to remember to look at. Uh, CT is obviously not the primary uh, method of looking at the chest or uh, looking at the breast, but sometimes it may be the only way that we pick up an abnormality. Uh, in fact, about almost 2% of incidental breast lesions are found to be malignant on chest CT and 30% uh, uh, of these are unsuspected. They just are shown uh, incidentally on the chest CT to be found. And with some older women who are not being screened for uh, breast cancer anymore, we, we will see some patients presenting with uh, metastatic disease and we find that it actually is coming from the breast. Gina, yeah. So can I ask that 1.85%, does that mean that of all the women having CTs of the chest, there's that many can breast cancers? Yeah. It's the most common cancer, so it's something we have to uh, remember. Um, <laughs> it, they're not all That's higher than uh, the even look for on the mom. But that's on chest CT for done for a specific cause, right? Yeah. yeah. It may be also the population in this study that was looked at. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting that sometimes we cut off the breast from the CT chest. It's not even included on it. Right. Not the images, but you're not looking at them. Exactly. Yeah. It's something, it's, we've become more and more aware of it, and we've picked up quite a few breast cancers just being aware of this. Uh, there are some predictors that help us to uh, say that it's going to be a breast cancer. Uh, if it's enhancing with contrast, we know that's a very high likelihood of being malignant. If there's axillary adenopathy, very, very likely. Uh, nipple retraction, skin thickening, or invasion of the pectoralis, all of those are really late findings, but if you see that, it's very suggestive. So I'll just show you, uh, we did um, a series looking at this, and this is a case uh, of a patient who had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and uh, they had been in remission. They had been followed over many years. And you can see on this CT that there is skin thickening uh, around the left, uh, left nipple, and there's this mass that is uh, hard to define. And you would never want to define it on the CT. You would just want to recognize it and suggest further imaging with either a mammogram or an ultrasound or both. Uh, and when you look back on that, this patient, it was there. It just slowly got bigger until now it became locally advanced. And, and that's why uh, it is important to recognize, especially if you have an older woman who may not be screened anymore uh, with mammography, that that might be the only method of detection. So was this lymphoma or was this primary breast cancer? So this turns out to be a primary breast cancer, uh, and she had had lymphoma as well. Uh, I have another case that um, this, I've seen this quite a few times now. Uh, a woman who presented with a cough, the chest x-ray was abnormal, <coughs> so she went for a CT showing numerous metastases. And when we looked at the breast, we could see right on the edge of the film, or on the, 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 the sequence, or the um, image, you can see that there is a mass there with calcification, uh, and it's indeterminate, we don't know, but we would worry about it being breast cancer, suggest the mammogram, and this is what we saw in the mammogram. We saw a big mass with adenopathy, and, uh, and this was a stage four breast cancer. So this was how her breast cancer was diagnosed. Uh, obviously, we want to try and avoid that <laughs> at, when, at this point. And she turned out had never been screened, so uh, she just was detected uh, by her met metastatic disease. So I have lots of cases of, of primary breast cancer showing up on, on the CT. Uh, we use breast shields. We still can identify uh, the breast uh, lesions. And if there's just an area that we think that it's asymmetric or there's a concern, we would refer them for a mammogram or an ultrasound. Um, thyroid is another area that we have to look at. Um, obviously, we see a lot of thyroid nodules, and there's a lot written about this. 
but typically if you have uh, a lesion that's bigger than a centimeter, that would be when you would probably look for uh, invasion of surrounding structures, adjacent lymphadenopathy, and refer them for an ultrasound. The esophagus is also another uh, area that we don't evaluate very well on CT. It's not well seen, it's not well distended, thickening can be very nonspecific. Uh, but if we see frank thickening, we obviously have to worry about esophageal uh, carcinoma and look for a, a cause otherwise. And here is that case I showed you early, this, earlier. This patient did have esophageal carcinoma with metastases, and you can see the thickening of the esophagus. Upper abdomen may be a cause of, uh, of, of chest pain, uh, and it may be an area where we might see sus unsuspected um, cancers of the colon or the adrenals. So after all of these blind spots and you're thinking, how the heck do I find them? <laughs> I, I just want to give you a few uh, tools and some of the ideas that some of the um, uh, researchers have provided that might help us in looking at uh, the chest. We obviously have a tremendous amount of images to look at and we want to make sure that we're accurate and efficient and we can't spend half an hour looking at the CT. So how can we improve our detection? Well, I think being aware of some of the pitfalls is helpful and then looking at some of these other techniques which I'll get to uh, in a minute. So we have to be aware of the satisfaction of search error is, is an important thing to remember and inattentional blindness is a uh, a, a concept that has been uh, discussed uh, in, in researchers who focus on a radiologist's ability to detect abnormalities. And inattentional blindness is where we have our blinders on looking for one specific area. So we are very good at detecting pulmonary nodules. You know, for the most part, we focus on that. And they have done studies, and this is a very interesting study, where uh, if you look at a series of, of images, you might clearly see the pulmonary nodule in this patient, but did you see the gorilla? <laughs> so, you know, it, they did a study where they looked at this uh, with 25 observers, radiologists, and they also compared it with 25 non-medical observers. And I'll show you the data. It's, it's amazing how many radiologists missed this. They even looked at the gorilla, but they did not register it as a gorilla. And in this study, uh, uh, Drew is, is a, a psychologist who works a lot in this at Harvard, and he has done a lot of work on this. And in this study, um, the radiologists were better at detecting lung nodules than the non-medical uh, observers in this study. But 20 out of 24 radiologists missed the gorilla and all of the naive observers, non-medical observers, miss the gorilla. So it's very easy when you're focused on one thing to miss the other uh, area. Now this is something that uh, I, I think is, uh, oh sorry, uh, I, I think MIPS are very uh, helpful as well, thin section MIPS. Uh, do you use them here? So. They, there's been some evidence that it helps radiologists identify more nodules. Uh, some, I think the jury's out. At our center, some of the radiologists don't even use them, and some of them do. Uh, it probably helps to make some lesions a bit more conspicuous. For example, it's very difficult to see the lesion uh, in the retropleural left upper lobe in this patient with the, just the thin sections, and with the MIP probably stands out a little bit better. You could say, well, what's the, it doesn't matter if you see that lesion or not. It's too small, but it, it helps maybe. Uh, probably with um, areas that are close to vessels, it may help identify the areas a bit better. So this uh, lesion, very hard to see uh, in the right upper lobe. With the MIP, maybe it's a little bit better when you have a, a thin section uh, MIP. So, it's probably there to help you if you, if you find it useful. I think it's, it's, the studies suggest that it helps improve the nodules. It increases your sensitivity. Um, okay, 
Now, synoptic reports have become very common. There's many, many advantages to synoptic reports, but there is no evidence that it reduces errors. So we, you know, we use them at the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, I think maybe it might help us to remember to look at all those extra pulmonary structures, but there's no, no data to support that it helps reduce the errors. Now, this is a concept that is very interesting of a way of helping to improve our ability to, to detect lesions. And it's the concept of how we look at the, the, the CTs. So we know that scrolling through the CTs is very helpful. It helps us improve our, our accuracy for detecting uh, lesions. But how we scroll through and how we look at the chest is actually quite variable. And this study by Drew uh, looked at eye position of radiologists as they, scan, as they scrolled through a chest CT with, uh, it was a phantom CT with definite nodules in it. And I just want to show you what the difference is. So if you look at this video, you can see that as the radiologist who is scanning is going from the top of the lungs down and picking up the nodules, the nodules are in black. And the green are the areas where the radiologist correctly identified the nodules. So you can see that that's how the radiologist is scanning through the chest going from the upper lobes to the lower lobes. They're picking up this many nodules. Compare that with the concept of a driller. And a driller is somebody who is going through one area of the chest at a time. So, for example, starting from the right upper lobe, scanning all in the anterior part, right into the right middle lobe, and then, um, then they're going uh, back up posteriorly along the right, and then they're doing the left anterior part of the lung, and then they're coming back up posteriorly. And if you look, they're getting, they're hitting more of those nodules, there are more green spots. They looked at this uh, and they showed that the same amount of time was taken by each set of radiologists. If you were a driller, take the same amount of time to cover the CT as, as a scanner. But there were far more true positives for a driller than, uh, than a, a scanner. So about 60% true positive rate for the driller as opposed to 48% of the, of the scanner. So you see, they didn't pick up all the nodules, but they picked up more. And uh, the number of false alarms was, was, no, was not significantly different. And what's interesting is that scanners tended to be a bit older and the drillers tended to be younger. And I think of it that probably it's a lot like uh, how we used to look at films we would always scan uh, upper lobes and then scan down as we, we looked at the film, whereas drillers uh, have only probably been trained on the, on the uh, packs, looking at uh, scrolling through images. So when I talk to my residents, most of them automatically say, well, I drill, that's how I do it. Uh, and a lot of the uh, radiologists who, who've been doing this for a lot longer may not be doing that. And so it's an idea of how to improve our accuracy by, by actually drilling. And uh, I can tell you that looking at a lot of, like say I'd have to report 20 lung cancer screening studies at a time, it's a lot more efficient to drill through, drill through the airways than drill through the upper, uh, uh, and uh, the right upper lung, right lower, middle lung, and then the back way. So I, I think it increases your confidence and your, um, your accuracy. So it's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, so the conclusions from their study is that um, for lung detection uh, tasks, it, uh, drilling is more efficient and more accurate than uh, scanning uh, and covers more of the lung actually with drilling than with scanning. So uh, that is sort of a summary of the, uh, of the, the pitfalls that we can uh, see on chest CT. We, I think recognizing some of the blind spots helps us to avoid some of those pitfalls. Uh, really a careful systematic review of the lungs, of the airways, the vessels, the heart, the chest wall, the upper abdomen, the breast tissue, the spine, and the pleural surfaces using axial and multiplanar coronal reformats uh, is very helpful, can avoid some of those errors. 
and it can uh, obviously have a, a real impact on timely intervention. Uh, I think it ultimately can actually improve our accuracy and our efficiency. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>